CIHT, uh, uh, we are a thriving professional institution, over 14,000 members and growing, 80 corporate partners, uh, very influential with government in terms of advising departments, particularly the Department of Transport on, on transport matters. Uh, we have a, an increasing reputation for the work that we're doing in advising on a wide range of matters on transport, not just highways, but transportation across the full transport sector. So our foundation is very much in highways, but we're branching out into, into all sectors of transport, including rail and public transport and the, the interfaces between all of those forms of transport. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm, I think you're all probably reasonably familiar with the programme. Having registered for tonight, uh, we're, we're, we're kicking off with Professor Nick Reed, who is the Academy Director at the TRL. Um, Nick is responsible for ensuring the technical quality of TRL's research outputs and supporting the academic development of TRL staff. Uh, and managing TRL's engagement with stakeholders in the industry and academia on programmes of collaborative nature. Uh, beyond that, I'm sure Nick is going to tell us what he's going to be talking tonight, tonight, talking about tonight, so I'll hand over to Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And, and again, echoing the thanks to CIHT and the team for, for their help in pulling uh, the event together tonight. And welcome to you all. So it's nice to see so many familiar faces and, and various friends of, of TRL and the project um, here to, to, to see what we've been up to. Uh, so actually, I'm not going to speak for too long this evening. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to save uh, my, my uh, consortium partners giving the same introduction and give them a chance to speak about what uh, the Gateway Project <coughs> means to them. So uh, we'll hear from, from Graham from Oxbotica, from Rama, from Royal College of Art and from, from Lola from Digital Greenwich. Um, so I'll kick off with, with an introduction. And I think it's recognised that we're moving towards a transportation, transportation system that is increasingly shared. Uh, I don't just mean shared with the other 25 million vehicles on the road, or however many it is, um, but shared uh, where we're sharing vehicles, making more efficient use of uh, the uh, vehicles that are available to us. Uh, increasingly connected, increasingly automated, and moving towards uh, low emission platforms to addressing the, the air quality concerns that we have at present. Uh, and in recognising that, the UK has been, uh, been doing a lot. The government have, have grasped the mantle and, and really tried to, uh, to position the UK as a, as a home for the development of connected and automated vehicles. So that started with the commissioning of the three projects of which Gateway was one uh, in December of 2014. And we got underway in, in October of the next year. Similar projects commissioned in Milton Keynes and Coventry, that was UK Auto Drive, and Ventura in Bristol, alongside the Gateway project in Greenwich. Later in 2015, DFT published their regulatory review of the, the rules around operating automated vehicles in the UK, following that with a code of practice giving guidance to organisations wanting to test automated vehicles on the sorts of uh, rules they should follow uh, in doing so on UK roads. So also in 2015, we had the creation of CCAF, the Centre for Connected Autonomous Vehicles, bringing together uh, in, input from Department for Transport and for um, the biz, as was the, the, the business innovation department, now Bayes, um, to be a single point of contact within government for connected automated vehicles. Really helpful uh, thing, uh, both in terms of the UK strategy, but also international um, uh, engagement on this uh, topic. And in addition to though, you know, setting out rules and, and having a point of contact in government, it's also helpful to have some resource to support uh, what we're doing. So in addition to the three driverless projects that were commissioned in December, there was a further 100 million uh, in, uh, investment in intelligent mobility projects matched with funds from industry. And that fund is being worked through through the, the, the connected and automated vehicle projects that are being awarded. Uh, the, the, the most recent of which just uh, just come out recently, and I suspect uh, Graham will, will talk some, to, uh, some on that uh, later. Uh, there's also 100 million, uh, an additional uh, investment going on in, into connected and automated vehicle test facilities. This is creating the, the test environment in which organisations would want to develop their capabilities. So it's, it's, it's just really good to see this continuous momentum in testing. 
So coming on to the, the Gateway project, it's, uh, it's a, a slide I expect many of you will have seen before, but a, a great consortium with lots of different um, interests represented among them, the communications through O2, the uh, insurance through RSA, energy through Shell, uh, cyber security through Imperial College. Um, really great to have uh, Rama speaking today, representing the Royal College of Art and the work they've done on engaging with the potential customers and stakeholders in, in automated vehicles. Uh, Lola in terms of the, the, the planning implications of automated vehicles and, and Graham from Oxbotica on the, the technology that is underpinning the, the vehicles that we're using. It's uh, supported by Funds for Innovate UK and, and the commercial partners involved and with CCAV uh, helping us guide the, the strategy. In addition to the funded partners, there's a, there's a great uh, advisory group um, of, of, um, uh, of organisations helping us, sort of trusted friends to the project if you like, uh, helping us to make sure we're delivering on uh, the, the, the different perspectives that those organisations might have and what automated vehicles might mean from their uh, viewpoints. We've had two meetings already, we're, we're due a third, overdue a third I'd say, um, and, and plan for that to happen in the next four to six weeks. So the project is based around three main uh, real-world trials of automated vehicles. The, the, the one that has had the most attention is that of the, the, the shuttle vehicles that we're testing on the Greenwich Peninsula, but we're also looking at how automation can support accessibility of transport and the uh, delivery of goods, particularly in, uh, vitally important in a city. How you move goods is, is at least as important as how you move, uh, move people. So can we use automated, quiet, uh, zero-emission vehicles to improve that? And the, the things we've been, the, the position we've got to today, we've, we've had a lot of the, the stakeholder engagement work that, that Ram has been doing. We've had the simulator trials, TRL have been running, looking at driver behaviour in regular cars and how that um, might be affected by the presence of automated vehicles on the network. We've had the trials Gabotics have done around uh, remote vehicle operation and how that can be achieved safely and securely um, over the cellular network, uh, working very closely with O2. Uh, and then the, the, the trials of the shuttles um, that, uh, that have happened over the last month or so as, as the first step in our, in our uh, work to test the use of that shuttle vehicle as a, as a service. And it, it, uh, it was launched uh, on the, the 4th of April, the press launch of public trials, and it got a lot of attention. So the, the, the BBC, you know, the usual news channels, BBC and Telegraph featured it uh, heavily. Also in the, the traditional automotive press, so Autocar were featuring it. Um, and also in the technology press, uh, so the likes of The Verge and, uh, and Gadget, Wired, all, all had features on, on the launch of our trials. Um, but then Sky came up with the, the key question, which is what happens when you put your mum in a driverless car? Um, and although this was a surprise to us when the, the reporter turned up with, uh, with his, his mum there, Karen, and her friend, Gwenfair, um, his mum is, uh, is on the right. She, she's not very keen on, on cars, whereas uh, Gwenfair has a, an MX-5 sports car and is, is, is a, a big enthusiast, and he just wanted to put them in. This is the point of our trials. It's about public engagement. What do people make of these types of vehicles? And when they first got in, they were uh, quite anxious, quite surprised. Where's the steering wheel? Where's the brake pedal? I'm not sure about this. But a, a few minutes later, they, uh, they, they had a, a different view, and they, they found that the experience of riding in these vehicles had changed um, their view. They still had some concerns. They, they would like them to be a bit quicker, and you know, fair enough. We're, we're in early days of the technology, uh, and, and they certainly could go quicker if we wanted them to. Um, and uh, interesting point, I wouldn't fancy it alone without the safety person inside. So the vehicles have to have a, a safety steward on board as part of the code of practice. Um, the transition to the point where we can take that safety steward out of the vehicle is going to be a, a, an interesting one, and, and there might be some, some, uh, some uh, awkward questions that we have to answer around how that happens. But uh, yeah, uh, 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 quite a surprise, and, and I think this, um, these opinions that, uh, that, 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 that the, uh, the ladies shared on the day, I think, will, will emerge in the research with the, the participants going through the same process. And just to end, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, the, the Gateway Project as um, the GATE, G-A-T-E, in the project means the Greenwich Automated Transport Environment. So when we started the project, um, really in July of 2014, you know, building the consortium, our, our view very much was that there would be something that persisted beyond um, the end of the project, that there would be a, a, 
an environment in which organisations would want to come and test their, their new technologies. Uh, and all that, our thinking has had to be accelerated because of the, all the, 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 the developments that are going on in this space. Um, and that has resulted in the creation of the UK Smart Mobility Living Lab, the use of the borough of Greenwich as a test environment for connected and automated vehicles. And we think this is, is underpinning what could be a revolution rather than an evolution in our transport system. But we need to do these tests. We need to test in the real world and understand how these technologies mix with pedestrians, with cyclists, but with also with buses, with the tubes, with trains. Uh, and, and Greenwich gives us an opportunity to do that. And so, yeah, we're, we're working really hard in creating Greenwich as that, that test environment um, in which we can understand how automated and connected vehicles can improve mobility in our cities. So that's as much as I wanted to say for this evening. Uh, I'll participate in the, the Q&A as well. But uh, next we have our, our uh, three speakers. Firstly, Lola fernandez Rondo from uh, Digital Greenwich. She's a head of urban planning, background in, in architecture, and leads on, on their work um, understanding the implications of automated vehicles and how that might affect the way they uh, deliver services in the future. Uh, we'll then have uh, Rama from uh, Royal College of Art, uh, who's the director of the Helen Hamlin Centre, internationally recognised for his work on uh, inclusive design. And finally, Graham, who's the CEO of, uh, of Oxwater, Graham Smith, um, who are uh, leading the work, uh, leading the, the technology that we're using um, in uh, operating automated vehicles on the peninsula, but also doing a, a wide range of other um, exciting projects around uh, the deployment of automated vehicles. So, Lola, over to you. Okay, good evening, and thank you very much for inviting DG Series to talk about how Greenwich is planning for connected and autonomous vehicles. But before I'm very briefly, I'd like to uh, introduce the team and the work we do. We are a multidisciplinary team reporting directly to the CEO of the Royal Borough of Greenwich, and our role is that of developing and implementing the Borough Smart City strategy. So, in particular, we are working on developing the concept of government as a platform to transform public services in Greenwich. And as part of this, we are working on the development of the Greenwich Community Platform and the Greenwich City Insights Centre, which will provide city um, managers and policy makers with valuable insights on how the city infrastructure and the city services, or the borough services, sorry, are performing. They also pr will provide citizens to access um, to, service, to the services and the information they need. Um, we are also responsible, or we also lead for the borough on some Innovate UK and European Commission projects, like Sharing Cities. And this is a European Horizon 2020 project, which looks to develop replicable smart city solutions that integrate transport, energy, and ICT. And we also have a series of connecting autonomous vehicles projects, um, uh, of which Gateway is one of them. Uh, and from a local authority point of view, our interest in connecting autonomous vehicles is twofold. First, we want to understand how they can help us improve the mobility services we deliver to our citizens. And two is understand the urban design and urban planning implications. So the rest of my presentation will be about the concepts and objectives we are currently testing in Greenwich to ensure both, uh, two things. One is that our built environment support the introduction of connecting autonomous vehicles, but the other one is to ensure a good and smart use of the technology associated to these to this, uh, vehicles to deliver um, a sustainable and resilient borough uh, and built environment. And in order to contextualize a bit more uh, our approach, I think it's important to say that Greenwich is one of the six East London growth boroughs, so it has the, the challenge and the, the responsibility to accommodate a large proportion of the capital's future growth. The um, population in Greenwich is estimated it will grow by a third in the next 15 years, and therefore the borough is already having to cope with pressures on public space pressures to deliver uh, services to a rapidly growing number of citizens, and there are also growing demands um, from the civil society and the business community to become a, a congestion and emission-free zone. So with this context, we are very clear that business as usual is no longer an option, and that we need to take more innovative and uh, holistic approaches. So we are addressing this strand of work by looking at the interdependencies between the design of the vehicle, the design of the mobility service, and the design of the built environment. And these interdependencies are evidenced by the evolution of the city's urban morphology and the most utilized transport systems. In the pre-industrial cities, most travel was on foot. People live close to where they work, 
and this resulted in compact dense human scale settlements. Industrialization fostered large scale urbanization, and this urban expansion was initially driven by the introduction of buses, trams, and regional railway systems, which allowed faster travel and um, access to a wider geographical area. And then further technological progress coupled with the reduction of mobility costs relative to income allowed the widespread adoption of privately owned vehicles and cities intensify and expanded horizontally. So throughout this journey, we've been substituting access by proximity with access by movement, and cities have moved from being compact and dense uh, urban settlements to sprawling cities. And this is the result of many cities around, in many cities around the world. I think it's important to note that at 50 kilometers per hour, cars take 40 times more space than buses, and that private cars are idle most of the time and occupy about 80% of the city's land area. So this doesn't seem to be a very productive use of the asset nor of the urban space. And if we continue this business as usual trend, the urban travel which today constitute a pro constitutes approximately uh, more than 60% of all kilometers traveled globally will increase threefold by 2050. The urban areas that occupy approximately 3% of the planet's surface will triple in only 50, 30 years. And the space uh, dedicated to parking in city centers, which today is about 80% of the city center's land area, will need to increase the equivalent of the size of Denmark. And this will lead to further densification, greater congestion, and higher car and parking prices on public space. And these outcomes will also be accompanied by a reduction on the city's productivity levels due to congestion and time loss in city trips. Also, projects are more expensive in sprawling cities because the uh, cost um, uh, of infrastructure per unit is more expensive at lower levels of urban density. From the social point of view, um, sprawling cities or cities that are highly dependent on, on city trips tend to be less socially inclusive. There is a correlation between city um, transport modes and, and social class. <coughs> and from the environmental point of view, even if in the future we assume that all vehicles will be electric, um, sprawling cities take much more space they, and they need much more physical infrastructure in place. And this will uh, obviously have a negative impact on the planet's natural resources. So in Greenwich, we are very clear that we need to uh, a paradigm shift. We need to stop thinking exclusively in terms of urban mobility, and we want to start thinking more in terms of urban accessibility, which can be increased by working on the city's urban form and urban structure through transport system and networks, and by deploying digital infrastructure and new technologies. So how can we increase accessibility in cities? By working on the city's urban morphology. Um, um, here, there are two examples of, uh, these are two examples of city models. The one on the left is a sprawl and segregation use city model. In this city, uses are segregated spatially. So there is an area in the city where we work, another one where we live, another one where we socialize or, or we uh, do our shopping. And when we map local workers and local residents, the blue and red lines in the graph, we see that there is no correlation. And as a result, the transport network is rather extensive and inefficient. On the contrary, if we go for the compact and mixed-use city, this uh, city, uh, in this type of cities, uses overlap spatially. It is about designing neighborhoods where we can live, we can work, we can socialize, uh, we can do our shopping, areas where we can meet our daily needs locally. And by doing that, we will be already minimizing the need for city trips. And the transport network in, the, in, the, in this type of cities will be much more compact and much more efficient. These cities are public and shared transport-oriented <coughs> cities, while, while the sprawl and segregation use city is a private car-oriented city which constantly needs more and more space and leads to further sprawl. And this slide uh, highlights and emphasizes the strong relationship between the city's urban form and the most utilized transport uh, systems. The, uh, the graph on the left shows the percentage of trees by modes of transport in London. In yellow, we have some inner London boroughs, which are characterized by higher densities and greater diversity of uses. And in blue, we have some outer London boroughs, characterized by the opposite, less lower densities and uh, less diversity of uses. 
and what we see is that the percentage of city trips made using non-motorized transport systems are higher in inner London than in outer London. And the reason uh, this is linked to the urban morphology of inner London. <coughs> the higher densities and the higher intensity of uses favor walking and cycling distances. We also see that the percentage of trips made um, using survey systems like the underground and the DLR is uh, higher in inner London than in outer London. And this is because the transport offer is richer in inner London. The, the transport network is it's richer and more extensive in inner London than in outer London. But this is linked to the city's urban morphology because, as we have said before, the provision of, of infrastructure per unit is more expensive at lower levels of urban density. And investing in transport uh, systems and networks in, in outer London is always more challenging. So this is in line with what we see on, on the right. We see that in inner London, we can move um, using shared transport, um, shared rail systems at 50 kilometers per hour, almost in all directions, flexibly in all directions. And in outer London, even though we can reach the same speed, we are directionally constrained. That is, that is because the transport offer is not as rich as in inner London. So in outer London, if we want to go from A to B, we are forced to, we have to pass by C, and then the connection between C and B is not ideal, it's not easy. So people uh, living and working on these areas opt to take their private car because it allows them to move flexibly in all directions. And this is the behavior we want to change and we want to address in, in Greenwich. We think that by adopting a holistic approach to um, urban accessibility, and working simultaneously on the city's urban morphology, on the city's urban morphology that is um, allocating uses across the space, uses functions and densities in a manner that we can decrease the, the need for city trips. Harnessing the potential of connecting autonomous vehicles and embracing mobility as a service, we want to provide um, a, um, a, the citizens in Greenwich with a seamless mobility solutions and avoid them to take their private car and contribute to the congestion and pollution levels we have today. So in Greenwich, we are very clear that we need to move away from a chaotic and unsustainable urban form to a much more sustainable and functionally structured city, and there is the, um, the polycentric city model. The polycentric city takes the principles of the compact and mixed use city and replicates them across the space in a hierarchical manner. So the polycentric city has different city centers with different degrees of self-sufficiency depending on the densities, the intensity of uses, and the density of flows. Um, so where we have uh, transport hubs, which are the red, uh, no, sorry, the, the black dots in the diagram, we can, those areas can accommodate greater densities and greater intensity of uses. The blue is darker. And as we move away from the transport hub, the density and intensity of uses decrease. And in the diagram, the blue gets lighter. So the, the polycentric city is, is organized in pyramids of intensific intensification around main transport hubs. And this structure approach allows us to design and plan for much more efficient and functionally structured transport <coughs> networks. So in a given polycentric city, where we have different city centers with different degrees of self-sufficiency, we will have the central city district. That center will be the higher up in the city's overall hierarchy. It will be the center accommodating higher densities and intensity of uses. Then we will have a second tier of city centers, third tier of city centers, neighborhoods, and local areas. And we see that each center has been assigned with a transport offer. So the central city district, which could be the equivalent of King's Cross in, Long in London, has an intercity train station, a metropolitan rail station, a tube and bus station, and it also needs to be designed to accommodate safe uh, walking and cycling. And as we move down in the hierarchy, the transport offer diminishes. So in Greenwich, we don't see connecting and autonomous vehicles competing against the existing public transport offer we have, because we don't think that they can beat in efficiency the London under Underground. But we see them um, uh, as complementing the existing pu public transport offer we have, and increasing accessibility in those areas of the borough that today are less well served by public transport offers. Um, and then with increasing number of connected devices around the world, the opportunities for vehicles to benefit from the um, real availability of real-time data are allowing connected autonomous vehicles 
to receive information from a wide diversity of uh, sources and, and devices, to process the relevant information. Based on this, make the informed decisions, which will in turn generate new data that which will be, be then again uh, shared with the network of connected devices. So connecting autonomous vehicles have sensors that allow them to gather information from their immediate surroundings, whether there are more vehicles, pedestrians, potholes, etc. They also have a comms component that allows them to receive informa information from beyond their immediate surroundings. So they will be able to know where, which areas of the city are congested, where there has been a traffic accident and traffic is, is slow, so how to reroute um, to uh, arrive to the destination uh, rapidly. Uh, which areas of the city are um, hosting a city event and therefore the mobility demand is likely to increase. So if they know this, they can drive themselves to those areas to match that demand. Um, they can receive information from other vehicles, that's the vehicle to vehicle uh, infrastructure and from other, um, uh, and from uh, yeah, from urban infrastructure li like sensors in, in land posts. And with all these feedback loops of information and real time data, connecting autonomous vehicles are able to be much more predict predictive and responsive in complex urban environments. They will be able to reduce the number of uh, road accidents, reduce congestion levels, and increase seamless mobility. But in order to fully harness the potential of connecting autonomous vehicles, in Greenwich we think they need to be accompanied by new business models and new mobility services. In Greenwich, we're looking to reduce the private vehicular mobility and the travel intensity in the borough by embracing mobility as a service that is moving away from asset ownership to um, usership, that is service provision and utilization. And by doing this, we think that we can make a much more uh, productive use of, us, of the asset, of the vehicle. Because if we were all to share a fleet of connecting autonomous vehicles, the number of vehicles needed to meet our mobility demand will be considerably less than if each of us were to own a, a, a car, a vehicle. But in order for fewer cars to meet the same mobility demand, they will, be, they will need to be constantly moving. So that will be already, we will be making a much more productive use of uh, the vehicle, of the asset. But, and if vehicles are constantly moving, it means that we can also make a much more uh, productive use of the space because we could eliminate all the parking spaces in cities and that space could be allocated to other uses. And in this, um, um, real in this hyper connected environment where we will receive data in real time, it's, uh, not only is it easier for us to match um, um, supply, uh, demand and, su uh, and um, Oh, it's supply and demand much more efficiently, but we can also predict the demand, and that allows us to develop flexible land use strategies. So in, if uh, the mobility demand in an area decreases, we can allocate the extra road space that is not needed at that time to a different use. And when the mobility demand picks up, then that space can be again uh, given for, um, for vehicle circulation. And this is my last slide, and, and I want to highlight with it the importance of taking a, a, a holistic approach. In Greenwich, we think that we cannot solve the uh, transport and the mobility challenges we have by exclusively working on the design of the vehicle, or the, the design of the service, or the design of the built environment. We need to approach these three holistically and look at the interdependencies, because what we'll find out is that in, in Greenwich or in a given city, we will have areas with different urban morphologies that will require different mobility services that need to be addressed with different types of vehicles. And only by adopting this holistic and integrated approach, we will be able to deliver a more, a more accessible, responsive, and resilient built environment, Greenwich um, borough in this case. Um, and that, that's me. Thank you very much. And I'm now handing over to Brahma.